In this series, we're examining counter-apologist Polygia's explanation of how Christianity began. In previous installments, we looked at Polygia's faulty epistemology and his psychoanalysis of the Apostle Peter. Please go ahead and watch the first two videos in this series if you haven't already, but let's not waste any time and jump right in. Here's what Polygia says about what happened to the Apostle Paul. Two years later, a Pharisee named Saul was traveling around persecuting these new Christians, burying the moral guilt of his actions under the certainty that he was doing the will of God. But on his way to Damascus, he suffered a psychotic break, possibly some form of guilt-induced post-traumatic stress, manifesting in a vision of the allegedly resurrected leader of the group he was harming. So affected by this experience, Saul changed his name to Paul and began recruiting for Christianity. What Apologia offers here is pure speculation, just as it was with Peter and the other apostles. Paul's guilt and PTSD are made up out of thin air. Paul's writings don't indicate that he felt any guilt about persecuting the church before he converted, and we have plenty of material to work with. In fact, Paul's writings indicate quite the opposite. Furthermore, Paul's guilt-induced hallucination must have been extremely powerful because it changed the mind of a vicious persecutor into a faithful martyr. I dare say that no comparable conversions have ever been recorded among notorious murdering fanatics in history. We also see no evidence of Paul being given to PTSD, despite him being in even more stressful situations as a Christian. He endured several beatings, shipwrecks, a stoning, and a whole lot more. Plus, we're not just dealing with any kind of hallucination. Paul was awake on his way to Damascus to persecute Christians when he was met on the road by Jesus in glory, rebuking him. It's also an odd kind of vision that leaves one blind for several days afterward. I'm sure Apologia would be happy to hit me with his For the Bible Tells Me So jingle here, but in the very near future I will be doing a series on the historical reliability on the book of Acts. I'll also link in the description below an excellent talk by Dr. Tim McGrew on this topic as well. Also, Paul wrote to former Jews and pagans saying that they knew that he had the signs of an apostle, meaning that he and the churches believed that he worked miracles. Paul also that he performed these miracles as he preached the gospel from Jerusalem to Illyricum. That covers a lot of ground. It's a strange type of mental episode that can cause someone to believe that they can perform signs and wonders. If these were signs of the apostle, that indicates that Peter, James, and John also had a reputation for miracles as well. And it isn't like Paul was some sort of wild-eyed TV evangelist. He was making this claim despite being persecuted from town to town. Finally, we know that Paul had spent time with Peter, James, and John and other members of the early church. Given that Paul was devoting his entire life to preaching a faith that he once tried to destroy, I'm sure that he had just more than a few questions about this Jesus. Jesus that he was formerly persecuting. I love this quote by William Frederick Farrar. He writes, Paul had to face the unutterable horror which to any Orthodox Jew was involved with the thought of a Messiah who had hung upon a tree. He had heard again and again the proofs which satisfied Annas and Gamaliel that Jesus was a deceiver of the people. The events on which the apostles relied in proof of his divinity had taken place in the full blaze of contemporary knowledge. He had not to deal with uncertainties of criticism or assaults on authenticity. He could question not ancient documents, but living men. He could analyze not fragmentary records, but existing evidence. He had thousands of means close at hand whereby he could test the reality or unreality of the resurrection, in which, until this time, he had so passionately and contemptuously disbelieved. So, Paul was exposed to evidence that we could only dream of. So, let's go ahead and sum up. Apologia's theory says that Peter had a bereavement hallucination, Paul experienced conversion disorder, James and John bought in based on Peter's testimony, and the Gospels were later inventions based on legends. We've seen that the likelihood of the first three are very low. If we were generous and gave a 25% chance that Peter, James, John, and Paul all became believers exactly as Apologia describes, you get a whopping .0039 or less than 1%. Not Powerball odds, but certainly not probable. So Apologia is honest when he admits that the probability of his theory about how Christianity began is actually quite low, as we mentioned in the first video. It's just that a miracle doesn't seem as likely to him, that's what makes his hypothesis probable. But again, if the facts can be accounted for without difficulty on the supposition of the resurrection happening, but not without greater implausibility on the assumption that the resurrection didn't happen, that does provide significant evidence for the resurrection. The more one works to explain away data to save their skeptical explanation, the less they're actually helping themselves. Let's say that you don't believe in Abraham Lincoln. You're an ah Lincolnist. You believe in president, sure, but just not that Lincoln guy. The story surrounding his life is simply too fantastical and too improbable. So the ah Lincolnist has to work extra hard in order to save their skepticism. They're going to have to multiply several fewer straightforward hypotheses in order to explain the data that we have for Lincoln. To be clear, I'm not saying that the evidence for Abraham Lincoln is the same as the evidence for the resurrection. It's just an illustration, but the point is this. Once you move more and more away from a simple explanation, and multiply more and more improbable independent hypotheses in order to explain away the data, you just end up shooting yourself in the foot. 
And I think that's exactly what Apologia has done here by complexifying the origins of Christianity to coincidences of mental breakdowns and gullibility. If you assume that the prior probability of a miracle is just so low that it can't be overcome by enough evidence for its favor, then you're going to reach for hypotheses like these, but you also need to argue why that is the case instead of just assuming that that should be accepted as a truism. And as we saw in part one, that's exactly what Apologia seems to be implying when he says that I've won the lottery without purchasing a ticket when I postulate that the resurrection actually happened. So I don't think that Apologia has come close to showing us Christianity probably began without the resurrection. I'm sorry, but possible and probable are not interchangeable terms. I think his scenario is so speculative that we can safely label his video as historical fiction. <laughs>